And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. Hey folks, today we're talking about Mystic Veil. Vale. Now Mystic Veil vale is a new game from AEG that when I first heard about it, I was tentatively very excited. Then I had a chance to play it at the Gamma Trade Show and then I was very excited. You may have seen a little preview video where I talked about it. Mystic Veil vale uses a card crafting system in which you are using clear cards and putting them on top of each other to build cards in a deck. The idea is, oh, I love the idea. Let's take a look at the game. Obviously, I already like the game, but I want to show you why. Each player in the game, and there can be up to four players, is going to get their own deck of cards. Each deck of cards has their own backing, and they come in sleeves that come with the game. And there's 20 cards in a deck, and a player's deck is only going to have those 20 cards over the course of the game. Now, there are three different types of cards in your basic deck. You have Cursed Lands, which provide you with one Spoil Symbol, and then one, basically, Money Symbol that you can have. There are completely blank cards, and then there are Fertile Soil cards, which show just um, the Money Symbol. Now, you'll notice that these Cursed lands or fertile lands are in different locations on the different cards. But what players are going to do at the beginning of the game is they're going to shuffle their deck of cards. And then what you do is you're going to turn these over like this. And each time you turn one over, you'll turn over the top card of your deck. And as soon as you th see three spoil symbols, you stop. Now this is considered your field, and this card is considered your on-deck card. This card's spoil symbol counts towards the number of spoil symbols that you have, if there are any here, um, but it, you don't get anything else from this card. This is going to be the first card, essentially, of your next hand. Now, at the beginning of a player's turn, if they want to, they can push. That means they're going to take this card here and add it to the field here and flip over the top card. Now, if this shows a spoil symbol on this top card, then they've busted it. They've spoiled, because you can't have four spoil symbols here, in fact, if you have a card that has multiple spoil symbols, it's even more dangerous. I could push again. I can keep pushing until I spoil or decide to stop. Here, I have spoiled. You can see that there are four symbols, so I've spoiled. Let's say, though, I had not been so foolish as to do that. Then, I'm going to look at the amount of money that I have here, three money, and now I can buy new cards, or new parts of cards. Now at the beginning of the game, you're going to have three decks of cards, level one, two, and three. These decks are going to be shuffled. There's a certain number of cards and decks based on the number of players, and three of them are going to be played face up. So you can use this, I'm calling it money, but it's actually mana. You can use this mana to buy new cards, so or new parts of cards. So for example, this card here has a cost of three. Um, and then it gives a special ability. When played, you may discard any card in your field. So that one might be worth getting, because I do have three to spend. This one here says, cancel all but one spoil on this card. Oh, well, maybe that's worth it. Ooh, this Wayfinder here, this gives me another mana. It's worth a point at the end of the game. And it gives me this spirit symbol, which we'll talk about in a minute. That one costs four. Now, if you remember, I only had three to spend on my cards. However, each player has one of these tokens. And these tokens are useful because uh, you can also use them to determine who's the start player at the beginning of the game. But you have a mana token like this, and you can flip this token over to get one extra mana anytime you want to. Um, then it's used. You can't use it again. However, ever, anytime you spoil, this gets flipped back over to the other side. So that's a kind of a positive thing of spoiling. So I can flip this over, and then I can take this card. Now, when I take this card, I can put it into any of my cards that I have in my field. However, I could not put it on top of a card that has the same thing. So if I have a card that already has a top part, I can't cover up that part. So I can decide here, hey, this cursed land here, I'm going to take this Wayfinder card, and I'm going to slide it in. And now when this card shows up, it's going to give me two mana, this spirit symbol here, and still has that cursed on it and then the card that I bought is replaced. You also, if you don't want to buy any of these cards here, and the cards get better in level one, two, and three, but the costs go up, you can also just buy some more fertile soil, and you can just go through this pile and buy anything you want, and these cost too. And this is another way to beef up your cards. 
So as the game continues, players' cards, you can get some pretty neat looking cards as you come along, and they're going to give you a lot. For example, this card here is going to give me three mana. It gives me different spirit symbols, four of them. I got animal and forest, and there's just different types of spirit symbols. This one here is going to give me a spirit symbol. This one also gives me victory points. A pile of victory points is set aside at the beginning of the game, and anytime you play a card that has a blue victory point symbol, you get that many. That pile of victory points is also the trigger to the end of the game. So you, when, as you, you take these victory points, you're going to quickly end the game. But these spirit symbols that you're going to get from different cards are important because over here there are Veil cards. And Veil cards are cards that you can buy and place in front of you. Some Veil cards, like for example, this one has a cost of two different spirit cards and it just gives you two points. This Veil card here, the Azure Lake, uh, gives you no victory points, but every harvest, which is every basically every turn when you're getting money, this gives you one extra mana that you can spend. Some of them are just worth a lot of points, but you need a lot of different symbols to get them. There are sometimes when you're going through the different cards in this deck, sometimes there's a wild sign and any spirit symbol can be used to get that one. And then there are cards that also give you a wild spirit symbol, which can be used to replace these. These cards are going to go face up in front of you. They are not considered part of your deck. So there are many different types of cards. Some cards provide this symbol here, which means nothing by itself, but then other ones, like for example here, you'll gain one point for each of those symbols that's on this card. So when I pay, play the Feral Chieftain, it's going to give me one because I have that symbol on my card, but if I manage to get other symbols on this card, like for example here, then this is going to give me two points. Uh, and you'll notice here, for example, though, this Dread Coil Cobra is great. It gives me four points every time I play it. But every time I play it, I'm also have another one of these spoil symbols, which can be very deadly. There are other cards, like this Lifebringer Seed, which cancels all the spoil symbols on that card. We have a Bear Totem. Now, this one is interesting because it provides you with a, a planting symbol, a, a life symbol, a growth symbol, which cancels one of the spoil symbols. So having these in your deck means your spoil symbols are less dangerous. I have a mindful owl here, who he gives you double mana. That's very useful, and when you're played, you can discard another card in your field. Uh, here's a stag, which gives you four points, and an animal spirit symbol, but again, also comes with that spoil. Uh, I already mentioned here, for example, the wild spirit symbol, and this one's two, so that's great, but this one's an expensive one, cost eight, or calm weather. Uh, this one here, I can look at my next on deck card. I can discard it if I want to. This one here, the Woodland Warden, gives me two points for every one of those symbols that's on the card. This crazy card here basically lets me get one point at the end of the game for every different symbol that's on this card. So if you put that on the right uh, mixture of cards, you can get a lot of points at the end of the game. This one here, the Magic Seed, gives you one mana for each other card that's in your field. But again, that one comes with a spoil symbol. And the game recommends that you don't put two spoil symbols on the same card, but you can do so if you want to live dangerously. So I told you the game ends when the pile of point tokens runs out. Everyone gets one last turn of whoever didn't, everyone gets an equal number of turns after the start player. And then you're going to take the number of point tokens that you have. You will add them to any points on the gray tokens that are on the different cards that you have built as the game goes by and also any of the Veil cards, those point tokens. Whoever has the most points is the winner of the game. Now, a couple things. Uh, on, on the cards themselves, there is a clear film that is on them. Uh, it's like this film that you get on a refrigerator when you buy it. And you can leave that on. It kind of keeps them from getting too scratched, but it might be a little bit harder to read them if you it's up to you whether you take them on or off. For me, I take it off because I love the feeling of it. The cards will get a little bit nicked because they are clear, but it doesn't really affect the game. It doesn't really affect how you can read through the other cards. And the sleeves are pretty good quality. In fact, the idea that your basic cards remain in those sleeves is very nice. And while there's a bit of setup and takedown as you take all of the cards out of your sleeves, it's not as much as I thought. Now, I really, really like this game. I find it extremely interesting. Uh, but let me try to be as objective as I can about it, even though I'm just a gaga over it. First of all, the theme is very thin. 
This is a me mechanical game. It really is. However, I like the mechanics of this game. It gives me that excited feel the first time I played Dominion. Uh, when I played Dominion, which was the first deck builder I played, this is the first card crafting system, and I love the idea of it. I love sitting there, the options of, okay, do I want to take these blank cards in my deck, because they're worthless in a sense, and add as many different things to as many of them as I can, or do I want to take some cards and make super cards, you know, have all three sections. Now, I tend to be towards the super card section, because I love flipping a card and be like, look what this card does for me, and you can make some great combos. However, to make a super card is not maybe as good because you have to add, you add to a card, then you have to wait till it comes to your deck again, then you add to it again, then you wait till it comes to your deck again, and then it's like that super card. Also, if you want to make the super, super card, and I've sat through and looked at all the combinations, it's going to be a very expensive process, and you only maybe get to use that card once or twice before the game ends, although the feeling of using that card is amazing. But I like the idea of the cards. I like that there's the top, middle, the bottom, and so sometimes you're like, oh, that's a perfect fit. <sighs> But on this card, I already used the middle, and that's a middle also. I like the, uh, basically, the fertile lands that you can add just to the card. So you, at the beginning, you might do that to get some more mana in the mix. And there's not a huge variety of different types of cards. They're either going to give you spirit symbols or, or uh, growth symbols or, you know, points. But I think that's good for this game. It keeps it very basic. Uh, there's not a lot of questions. The rule book comes with explanations on all the different cards. But I don't know that I've looked at it maybe more than once at this point in time. It's just very easy to understand what the cards do. Now, the game does come with a push-your-luck aspect. Now, push-your-luck aspect for me usually means I love it and I'm going to lose. However, in this game, it's not necessarily the case because I'm able to control my push-your-luck. I and mean, I like the fact that, ooh, I can take another card and get some more stuff, but I might get enough of those spoil symbols. At the same time, I'll sit there and go, this is really good. I can buy that card I need. You will find as the game goes by that you'll have maybe five to spend. And the cards you buy want to buy is six. And you'll sit there and go, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. You know, uh, what should I do here? Should I, should I push my luck a little bit? And sometimes you push your luck and you fail. Now, the good news is you get to flip over that token. But the bad news is you essentially gave up a turn to do so. You can spoil a few times over the game. It's not going to kill you. Do too many times, though. You're going to lose to a player who might be a little bit more cautious than you. Being super cautious, though, means you might give those bigger cards to the other player. And I like that. It's a push-your-luck game, but it's not like you have to push your luck all the time. And at the same time, you are just trying to basically do what you're doing. The Veil cards are also a nice thing. You can concentrate on buying Veil cards, or you can concentrate on getting other cards in your deck. It gives you kind of basically a two-pronged strategy. Get cards that give you points that you're taking from the point token tile, or get you cards that give you spirit symbols that give you the Veil cards. So all this works together. It, it's a very nice system. Uh, one of the things that I really like about the game is that at the end of your turn, you flip over cards from your deck until you have three spoil symbols showing. Uh, one on your on deck and the other two there. You do that at the end of your turn. However, before you do that, the next person can go. So you are kind of setting up for your next turn during someone else's turn, and that does make the game go faster. Now, with all deck builders, this game works best with less players. It just always do, because it's faster, back and forth, back and forth. And so a two-player game of this, I like the best. However, a four-player game is not interminably long. It might be a little bit longer the first couple times as you're learning what the cards do. But after a while, you're like, yep, I want that card. Oh, there's that card I get. You know, and so you're adding these cards to your deck. And basically, the choices you have here are magnified a little bit more than a regular deck building game, because you're deciding what to buy then you're deciding which card you are going to make bigger. Uh, I just, I, I have to say, this game is a gimmick game, right? It's the card crafting system. And in the rule book, there's another card crafting system game that's coming from AEG in the future, and I look forward to that. And so I wonder if as time goes by, that this gimmick might be used in a better game, who knows? But for now, I really love this one. This is fantastic, and I'm already sitting there and thinking about, ooh, what, what are they gonna add in an expansion? Which, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm very happy with the base game, but I'm really looking forward to see what comes out in the future. And I like how this game just is, it just flows so smoothly, and it's one of those games that when I'm done playing, I'm like, hmm, that's interesting, let's play again. Let's play again. And that's good for me. I really enjoy this game. I think if you like Dominion, you're going to like this game. If you like the idea of being able to build cards and go different routes and play the same game but try something different the next time, it's going to be a lot of fun. This clear card gimmick has been used in many games before, but this is the first one in which it phenomenally works.
The other ones, it was okay at best. Here, it is great. Try it out. I highly, highly recommend Mystic Veil. Dice Tower Judgment into my collection. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com. Shut the door! Boop. Boop.